Welcome to Diagnosing Healthcare, a podcast featuring thought-provoking conversations about the latest legal, policy, and regulatory issues in healthcare. While these issues may seem like hurdles, we'll also look at the business opportunities and solutions that exist. Diagnosing Healthcare is brought to you by the healthcare lawyers at Epstein Becker Green, a leading law firm that has more than 40 years experience serving clients in the healthcare industry nationwide. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Diagnosing Healthcare. I'm your host, Bonnie Scott, and I'm an attorney in Epstein Becker Green's healthcare and life sciences practice based out of our LA office. On today's episode, we will be focusing on telehealth fraud and abuse enforcement. We will look at how the enforcement landscape evolved over the course of 2020 and consider what might be next. We will also discuss some ways telehealth providers might mitigate their enforcement risk as we move into the new year. Telehealth was certainly gaining traction before 2020, but the COVID-19 pandemic really launched telehealth into the spotlight. Over the last year, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of medical providers taking their practices virtual. An estimated 41 million adults used telehealth in 2020, nearly doubling usage from 2019. Telehealth has also drawn significant interest from startup companies looking to capitalize on the promise of this growing industry. Yet, with all this promise, there is, of course, risk. In September 2020, the U.S. Department of Justice and the Office of Inspector General crystallized this point for us, announcing their takedown of more than 300 telehealth providers that were charged with submitting more than $6 billion in false and fraudulent claims to both federal government and private payers. And there's good indication that this ramp up in telehealth enforcement is here to stay. In fact, OIG lists four active work plan items related to telehealth. And these work plan items reflect areas where OIG has audits and inspections either planned or already underway. This uptick in enforcement certainly warrants close consideration by telehealth providers, especially those that are new to the space and haven't really built out their compliance programs. Here with me today to talk more about the enforcement outlook in the telehealth space and steps that can be taken to try to stay off the radar of government regulators are EBG attorneys Melissa Jampel and Amy Lerman. Melissa, Amy, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Bonnie, for having me today. This is certainly one of my favorite topics, especially when Amy's also one of the participants. Okay, so before we get into what has happened over the course of 2020, Melissa, can you give us a little bit of insight into what the enforcement landscape looked at pre-2020 and before the COVID-19 pandemic hit? Thanks, Bonnie. So 2016 was the time when we saw the first False Claims Act enforcement on the civil side involving telehealth, or some people call it telemedicine. That has radically changed since then. We've seen a number of cases that have been brought at the federal level by both U.S. Attorney's Offices and the Department of Justice's Healthcare Fraud Strike Force around the country. Starting in 2019, we had the first large enforcement actions. In April of 2019, there was a large takedown in the DME space, which targeted alleged illegal kickbacks and bribes by DME companies in exchange for the referral of Medicare beneficiaries by medical professionals working with fraudulent telemedicine companies for back, shoulder, wrist, and knee braces that the government claimed were medically unnecessary. And notably in that particular takedown, there was a huge tie-in into international telemarketing networks and overseas call centers. Similarly, in September of 2019, the government moved into genetic testing and through what was called Operation Double Helix, focused on telemedicine and cancer genetic testing cases where there were allegations that telemedicine was involved in referring patients to clinical laboratory cases for what some claim are medically unnecessary services. Going back to the most recent September 2020 takedown announcement, was that similar conduct that was the subject of of that takedown or has that evolved? Yes, Bonnie, it was the same, but it was on a larger scale. So it involved both DME cancer genetic testing, sober homes, and other types of alleged Medicare and Medicaid fraud that relied in large part on telemedicine marketers, doctors who were working for telemedicine companies, 
as well as other individuals in the healthcare system. Notably, in the September of 2020 takedown, the government claimed that it charged 345 defendants across 51 judicial districts with allegedly submitting more than $6 billion in what they said were false and fraudulent claims relating to federal health care programs and to private payers. So these enforcement actions actually did not occur on the same day, despite the word takedown, it's sort of a misnomer, and occurred over a six-month period leading up to September of 2020. But it certainly has made an impact and gotten a lot of people to pause and think about their compliance practices and what are best practices within the industry. And Amy, can you tell us a little bit more about what a telehealth provider should be doing to keep their compliance in good order and stay off the enforcement radar? Absolutely. Well, I think Melissa touched upon a number of things that assuming a company is is set up and, and running and operational, providing services, you know, really needs to be taking that next step, as Melissa said, from a compliance perspective and looking for areas where there are potential areas of high risk, and then secondarily, how they can mitigate those risks. So some of those areas, as I think the the latest takedown has touched upon, would be things like aggressive marketing techniques and, and how telemedicine companies are pulling in potential customers, patients, subscribers, users, whatever they're called, how are they bringing them to the table to utilize their services? And, and some of the techniques that we've been able now to read about a little bit as we've read descriptions of, of these various indictments have been you know, fairly aggressive, not only in the, the government payer space, bringing Medicare, Medicaid, and other government beneficiaries to the table, but just in general, just bringing people in, leading me into a, a next area, inducing you know, these, these customers and, and patients to take on, order, utilize services that may not actually be medically necessary. And I think that that's something that telemedicine providers need to be conscious of, especially when, when dealing with the government healthcare programs. But just in general, that um, it, it's very easy to utilize telemedicine services. You're doing it from the comfort of your home. And when you start to think about things, especially in areas like prescribing and access to drugs and devices and things that normally require careful analysis from a healthcare provider about whether that is a medically necessary item for the patient to be using, are telemedicine providers putting up the same standard of care to ensure that when someone is prescribed a drug, for example, it's actually necessary that they're prescribed a drug for a medical reason. And I think the third big area, which as a healthcare attorney working with, you know, various companies and providers of all sizes in this space, we talk about constantly is trying to ensure that the interactions between customers or patients or users and and healthcare providers through these telemedicine companies and infrastructures are are genuine and thorough and and really upholding a standard of care. We're going to talk, I know, a little bit about you know, being a new provider in the space. But I think that one of the things that I've noticed is sometimes, you know, there's so much technology and people trying to make this as easy as possible for people. There are still standards that I think people have to be careful to uphold with respect to ensuring that those interactions via telemedicine are, you know, consistent with a certain standard of care, particularly in the area of prescribing practices. So where can companies be going? I know that was kind of the second part of your question, Bonnie. There are definitely things that providers of telemedicine services can be doing and defining the scope of the services that are being offered. And, and just as importantly, what will not be offered? Not everything can be done via telemedicine. That has become very clear. So I think providers need to be very clear about you know, what they can and what they cannot do and when it's time for someone utilizing one of these services to seek care and assistance in a different modality. Going back to something Melissa said as well, focusing on compliance. A lot of telemedicine companies now have been around for a while. This isn't new. 2020, as you said, is not the first time we're seeing telemedicine. So what what are you doing as a provider of these services to ensure that you have a compliance infrastructure? And, and are you thinking about that? And if not, should you be? So those are some of the things that, that I wanted to touch on as far as companies that are kind of going full steam ahead in this space, just to make sure they're spotting risks as well as anticipating what they can be doing to avoid them. So I think Amy's hit on a couple of points, which from the government enforcement perspective are super important. So the government is very much focused on marketing 
And how are telemedicine companies getting their patients? How are they getting their doctors? So one of the cases that was charged recently in the September 2020 takedown, there was a doctor who was working for 17 different telemedicine companies. That raised a red flag with the government, and that's something that providers should be thinking about. But also, telemedicine companies should be thinking about. What are other activities are our providers up to? It also leads into an important point that Amy just said, which is, what is a physician-patient relationship? I think that issue is very much, in 2021, a key issue that people are thinking about. It's changing. How long is an appropriate interaction between a doctor and a patient to have an appropriate physician-patient relationship? So if you line up all of the indictments, there's a lot of allegations by the federal government, by the Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's offices, that there weren't real physician-patient relationships. But I think there's a lot of rethinking as to what exactly that, that means. Yeah, it sounds like some of the enforcement is focused on some pretty egregious conduct, like a physician working for 17 different telehealth companies, but also some of the finer points are also being scrutinized, like the patient physician relationships and and what needs to be in place there. But for a telehealth provider that's generally trying to to do good and makes good faith efforts to comply with the law, are are they really needing to worry here or or what do you think? I think that telehealth is certainly having a, a moment unlike it has had prior to this. And so as Melissa said, there are enforcement eyes on companies that are in this space. But I think just as important, there's so much data that's being gathered. You know, more payers than ever are covering tele and a wide array of telemedicine services. So there is a tremendous amount of data being gathered by, you know, various payers, both in the government as well as the commercial space. There is data being gathered by OIG. You mentioned, Bonnie, that the latest OIG work plan had several different audit items related to telehealth. So you really, you cannot, as a telehealth provider, rest on your laurels. You, you have to be following the changing rules. And certainly a lot has changed in the past year because of COVID specifically. But just as importantly as the fact that it has changed, I think at least some of it is going to shift back to certain standards that were in place prior to February or March of, of this year. But I also think that what the data and all the experience that we now have, you know, from 2020 has shown is that telehealth is, it certainly has cemented its place as a modality of care and it's here to stay. Rules are going to be changing in both directions. I think certain things are going to become more permissive and, and there's going to be more flexibility for telehealth providers. But I think also certain rules are going to be still held very rigidly, especially at the state level. We haven't really gotten into that, but there's so much of the regulatory infrastructure for telehealth providers that still sits at the state level. So really it's a game for telehealth providers of understanding every state and the rules that they have in place for how these services are going to be provided, touching on things like what is the standard of care? How does someone need to be licensed? What are the criteria in order to issue someone a remote prescription? Those are all things that states are still, you know, having the control over dictating. So, you know, it's anyone's guess what states will do in response to the change in time and everything that we've seen experientially through COVID. And I think 2021 is going to be a very interesting year on the regulatory front for these providers as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with Amy. There's going to be a lot of changes ahead. I think that once the COVID-19 crisis is passed, which we all can't wait for, the OIG likely will attempt to determine whether its prospective waiver of administrative sanctions resulted in overutilization of telehealth services or led to inappropriate increased costs to federal health care programs. And so at least on the federal government side, I think there's going to be a real emphasis on costs as Amy said before, medical necessity, which is at the absolute center of everything, as well as, you know, how independent are doctors when they're doing the telehealth? How should we contain costs? I think that those are all issues that are going to be teed up and very ripe for the government to wade through, through all of the data that Amy was talking about. But not just enforcement, like, you know, I think of enforcement as sort of the one, one extreme at one end. I think there's also going to be a ton of audit activity. So we can't 
forget about that part of it. And I think telehealth providers, many of whom are new to healthcare, not everyone comes in as an experienced seasoned healthcare provider, just deciding to all of a sudden utilize telemedicine. We have, you know, people who have spent their professional lives in tech and other places coming to the table, which is great, you know, so much innovation, but not being as familiar with healthcare and how highly regulated an industry it is. So thinking about how all this data and all this experience is going to generate not just the enforcement we're talking about and sort of the the scrutiny of the enforcers like OIG, states, federal government, et cetera, but just normal payers wanting to understand how these services are being documented and whether as providers they're going through that checklist. Is this a medically necessary service? Is this appropriate to be providing via telehealth? So I think as providers, you know, not necessarily resulting in bad, but just like another compliance step to be prepared for a heightened level of audit activity. And I think we're already seeing some of that, that audit requests are now coming in from payers of various types and they're interested in telehealth. So I think that's something that providers need to, from a compliance perspective, be prepared for. It's another operational step they will need to take to be prepared to respond to those audits. So Amy, as you were explaining that, I I thought of a phrase that you always say when we talk about this area, which is document, document, document. I do. Um, You know, certainly appropriate in this point. And, you know, I, I do think it's important for people to keep meticulous records so that when there is the audit that comes by, that you can prove that it was medically necessary, that the services were rendered, and that they were appropriate for the care and treatment of the patient. Any thoughts on that? I mean, that and also just the state, the regulatory guidance, I think we we talk all the time, you know, to each other. And I talk a lot with clients about how some of it is so gray and that's hard for providers to wrap their heads around. What is the standard of care? What is the state saying about how I can use technology? This is a great opportunity as well to document, to say, this is what I understood the law in fill in blank with name of state to be at this time. So this is what we did as as a provider to ensure that we were compliant with that law. Regulators in various states are still trying to figure a lot of this out themselves. We talk with them pretty regularly and there's always like new technology and not everyone wants to do video and there's other forms of communication. Are those sufficient? And so I think that there are constantly questions being asked by telemedicine providers that throw even the regulators into a quandary about, you know, how to set those standards and in a way that they're clear and everybody will follow them. And so I think that the intentions are good in many cases, but the guidance isn't that clear. So yet another opportunity, if you document to say, well, this is how we understood it at the time. And this is our understanding of the law, because again, state by state, the standard does change a little bit. Going into 2021, what else should we be thinking about here? Do you, do we think it's going to be more of the same? I know we think there'll be an uptick in audit activity. Do you expect to see even more enforcement than we saw in 2020? Similar? What are your thoughts? So from the Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney Office perspective, I definitely think there's going to be an uptick in enforcement as these pandemic numbers and billings and coding and all of that gets gets flushed out. So I think that, you know, many people have tried telemedicine for the first time during the pandemic. I've tried it for the first time during the pandemic. I've tried it for my family members. I've taken the family members to the emergency room based on recommendations through a telemedicine visit. And I think people are getting very comfortable with that. So as Amy was talking about earlier in our our discussion here today, it's led to a sea change in terms of how people feel in their comfort level as to what they feel. But the federal government and enforcement activities always go where the money goes. So they follow the money trail. And certainly in healthcare, that is the number one rule for those of us who who watch enforcement activity. And that's where the money is going to be flowing during this period of time when we've had the COVID crisis. And although some restrictions have been relaxed, and I do think that there's even more gray areas on areas that were more defined before the pandemic, it's going to take a while to shake out. So, you know, let's say in February, something wasn't permitted under Medicare, which only permitted rural telehealth. And then later on this summer, it's expanded dramatically. Why is that a problem? A lot of people are going to be asking themselves, why do we need to go back to rural only telehealth? 
from an advice giving perspective, that's exactly what we've been, you know, talking to clients about starting out because there are so many that have really, I think, seized an opportunity in 2020, either to grow something that they had started, make it bigger, or, or just start from scratch. And there's a lot of really great ideas out there that have been launched in 2020. But I think the, my number one piece of advice to people has been, do not base your strategy and your understanding of the regulatory infrastructure on what is happening today. Let's take a step back and let's help you understand what the law was prior to you know February 1st of this year, especially in areas like what were the Medicare requirements, a population that really can benefit and I think has benefited from utilizing telehealth. Once Medicare relaxed some of the restrictions that it did, you know, in the spring, I think that really has opened things up. But is Medicare going to go back to exactly what they were doing, you know, on January 31st? I, I don't know, but I don't know if they're going to necessarily have quite as much flexibility. It's going to be anyone's guess to see what Medicare various payers and the states, importantly, are going to do because of the licenses that are behind all of these providers who are providing the telemedicine services that the professional boards in all the states get to say, well, you know, here are the requirements that we would like providers to have. Here are the rules we would like them to follow. And they've relaxed a lot of those things, but they've all said, this is temporary. We will roll this back at some point. And we haven't yet really seen from many states that they're looking yet at least to make things permanent. I think that that's a theme of conversation we're, we're hearing and we could expect to see from states that they will roll in a direction that is more like what they are doing now, but I don't, I don't think that's a guarantee for every state as well. So it's just, it's a lot to follow as we roll into 2021 for providers in the space. Well, thank you both for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Bonnie. This was great. Thanks, Bonnie. This was great. Thanks for having me. To provide a short recap of today's conversation, telehealth surged onto the scene in 2020, largely because of necessity, but it has really been a valuable resource from a patient access standpoint during the course of the pandemic. And we saw regulatory efforts across the board to allow additional flexibility in the telehealth space so these services could be provided more freely. However, telehealth is an area susceptible to fraud and abuse, and there are bad actors out there that will use aggressive marketing tactics to mislead patients or bill payers for illegitimate services. And government regulators are well aware of all of this. So unsurprisingly, throughout 2020, we saw increased enforcement in the telehealth space, and we expect it to be an area of continued government enforcement interest as we move into 2021. So the takeaway for telehealth providers is that they should be cautious, especially as they think about things like defining the scope of services they can offer via telehealth, how services are provided, and what their compliance infrastructure should look like. Telehealth providers should also be extremely diligent with their record keeping and documentation practices in light of expected uptick in audit activity. This focus on compliance will help providers detect, prevent, and correct any inappropriate conduct and really position themselves well as the regulatory and enforcement landscape continues to evolve. Thanks very much for tuning into Diagnosing Healthcare. We hope you join us again soon. Thank you for listening to Diagnosing Healthcare. For show notes on today's episode, additional episodes, and more insights on trending issues in healthcare, please visit diagnosinghealthcare.com and be sure to subscribe on your preferred platform. The Employment Law This Week and Diagnosing Healthcare podcasts are presented by Epstein, Becker, and Green, PC. All rights are reserved. This audio recording includes information about legal issues and legal developments. Such materials are for informational purposes only and may not reflect the most current legal developments. These informational materials are not intended and should not be taken as legal advice on any particular set of facts or circumstances. And these materials are not a substitute for the advice of competent counsel. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship has been created by this audio recording. This audio recording may be considered attorney advertising in some jurisdictions under the applicable law and ethical rules. The determination of the need for legal services and the choice of a lawyer are extremely important decisions and should not be based solely upon advertisements or self-proclaimed expertise. No representation is made that the quality of the legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal services performed by other lawyers.